Welcome everybody. My name is Alex Zanus. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of the Building Environment. Um, a really great pleasure and privilege to uh, be here tonight with Professor James Warwick on the occasion of the 100th anniversary of the selection of the competition winner for Canberra and, uh, and the work of Burley Griffin in Canberra. Um, I will begin the evening by acknowledging that, that we are here today on the traditional land of the Aboriginal people. I would particularly like to pay my respects to the Bedigal people that are the traditional custodians of this land. I would also like to pay my respects to the elders, both past and present, and extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are present here today. And a special welcome to members of the Advisory Council, Oi Chung, Alice Spiegelman, Oliver Kratzer, and also Jane Irwin, who is the President of the Institute of Landscape Architects, our colleagues from the faculty and from other academic institutions, alumni and supporters. This is the fourth of our series this year. Uh, we started with Professor Michael Newman. We had Hiroshi, Hiroshi Sambuchi, and then most recently uh, the Honourable, Honourable Sir Anthony Mason, who, um, whose lecture on what might have appeared to be a dry topic, building contracts and legislation, turned out to be insightful and fascinating. We couldn't, we couldn't move to a more difficult, different topic and, and uh, that's part of the, the, um, the, the theme of the Woodson series in that it deals with all the disciplines that together make up the built environment. So it's part of our academic calendar and it's our way of engaging with, with uh, the issues at a public level, many of which are central to what we do in the faculty. And in fact tonight's lecture delivered by a uh, Professor of Landscape Architecture, James Warwick, is from an acknowledged authority on Canberra. James is currently our um, program director in the Urban Development and Design Program, a program that's been successfully running for about 20 years. Prior to joining UNSW, uh, James was the head of Landscape Architecture unit at RMIT, and he also brought um, to us along with that experience, uh, important uh, posts as visiting lecturer, Master of Urban Design course and lecturer in landscape architecture at RMIT. He is also a lecturer in landscape architecture at the Col Canberra College of Advanced Education. And before, uh, w after graduation from Harvard and during Harvard, James was telling me earlier, he worked for the extraordinary Boston Architectural Center run by Peter Blake, but after graduation, he held positions at the History of City Planning, Architecture and Landscape Architecture Department of Fine Arts at the University of Massachusetts and at the Architectural History and Theory Boston Architectural Center of Massachusetts. James is a very distinguished academic scholar and genuine public intellectual. Um, his hand is everywhere in many parts of the world but certainly in Sydney and his, his work engaging with the, the issues of the world's uh, city <laughs> development issues around the world is uh, a fantastic contribution to our faculty. So it's a great pleasure now to hear James tonight on one of his most important contributions to our, our understanding of the world, Canberra. So welcome James Warwick. Thank you, Alec, for that uh, generous introduction and thank you everybody for coming uh, this evening for this uh, occasion. Yes, my, my topic, of course, is uh, Griffin and Canberra, really the 100th anniversary of Walter Burley Griffin's success in the Australian Federal Capital Competition. At the height of the Utzon resignation crisis in March 1966, University of New South Wales architecture students joined a Bring Back Utzon protest of about a thousand people that assembled at the gates of the Sydney Opera House construction site on Benelong Point. Led by Hal Missingham, Director of the Art Gallery of New South Wales, Harry Seidler and Patrick White, the protesters marched up Macquarie Street to Parliament House. Among the placards organised for the march, there were a number emblazoned with the memorable words, Griffin, now Utzon. In press photos of the day, we can see Griffin, now Utzon placards carried by Joe Somfey, Peter Stronach, and Sydney University student Bobby Wilson. 
Those three words said all that was needed to be said about the long history of compromise that afflicts design competitions in Australia and cuts down genius. In 1920, Walter Willie Griffin, winner of the international competition for the design of the Australian Federal Capital, was forced from his position as Federal Capital Director of Design and Construction, for just like Jörn Utzen in those March days of 1966, he refused to serve on a government-appointed advisory panel set up to replace him as design director of the project. As Harry Seidler said to the protest crowd about Utzon and the Opera House, an incredible brilliance has been necessary to bring these ideas to paper. Nobody anywhere in the world could step into this situation and make anything but a ridiculous compromise. In Canberra, the air of compromise hangs over the valley of the Molonglo like an early morning fog, uh, blanketing the brilliance of the original design intent. However, we meet this evening to celebrate Canberra's moment of brilliance, for it was on this day, 100 years ago, that the winner of the Australian Federal Capital Competition was announced. At noon, on the 23rd of May, 1912, the group we see in this photograph was assembled in the Russell Street Melbourne office of the Minister for Home Affairs in the Fisher Government, the Honourable King O'Malley, for the ceremony of opening the sealed envelope to identify the winner of the competition. The group includes, on the left, the members of the assessment board who had advised the Minister, John Montgomery Cohn, James Alexander Smith and John Kirkpatrick. On the right, senior members of the Department of Home Affairs, the permanent head, Colonel David Miller, Chief Clark, Walter Bingle, and the Director General of Works, Colonel Percy Owen. Standing at the rear were members of the press gallery, including Keith Murdoch, representing the Melbourne Age. The competition had been controversial, banned by the Royal Institute of British Architects and affiliated institutes across the British Empire, including the Australian states, for conditions deemed unsatisfactory, most notably relegation of the assessment board to an advisory role with ultimate decision power vested in Minister O'Malley. Nevertheless, the competition attracted 137 entries from all around the world. The impressive array of drawings was mounted in the state ballroom of Government House, Melbourne, for examination by the assessment board. A short list of 46 was selected and with photographic reproductions to hand, the assessment board journeyed to Canberra for detailed consideration on the ground. The board was chaired by John Montgomery Cohn, a consulting engineer from Melbourne who had expertise in road construction, water, sewerage and drainage, irrigation and surveying. The second member was James Alexander Smith, nominee of the Victorian Institute of Engineers, who had overseen construction of the difficult railway link between Flinders Street and Spencer Street stations in Melbourne. <laughs> Third member was a politically well-connected architect from Sydney, John Kirkpatrick, consultant architect to the recently created Commonwealth Bank and designer of its money box headquarters in Martin Place. Hobart architect Conway Inglis Clark served as secretary to the board. He was son of one of the principal authors of the Australian Constitution, Andrew Inglis Clark, and had spent five years in the United States working in the offices of Shepley, Rutan and Coolidge in Boston, the successor firm to the office of H.H. H. Richardson, and McKim, Mead and White in New York. Controversy continued through the deliberation period. The assessment board was divided. The majority, James Alexander Smith and John Kirkpatrick, selected designs numbers 29, 18 and 4 as prize winners in that order. The chairman, John Montgomery Cohn, selected designs numbers 10, 14 and 81. 
On the 22nd of May 1912, King O'Malley, Prime Minister Andrew Fisher and several other cabinet ministers, uh, oh sorry, going backwards, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, inspected the designs uh, in the ballroom of William Wardell's Government House Melbourne. The ministers proceeded to hold an informal cabinet meeting on the spot and decided to accept the majority report of the assessment board submitted by James Alexander Smith and John Kirkpatrick. The stage was set for the meeting in King O'Malley's office at noon the next day. The group assembled around a large table. With due ceremony, the seals on the envelopes that had been entrusted to the Governor General for safekeeping were inspected by all present, including the press. At the command of King O'Malley, the Chief Clerk, Walter Bingle, broke the seal on envelope number 29 and handed the contents to the minister. King O'Malley read out the name of the winner. Mr. Walter Burley Griffin, architect and landscape architect, 1200 Steinway Hall, Chicago. Griffin, 35 years old, had achieved world renown. A graduate of the University of Illinois who had worked with Frank Lloyd Wright and been in independent practice since 1906, had won the international competition. Of course, we know now that the Griffin success was a joint achievement with his brilliant architect wife, Marion Marnie Griffin, the second woman to graduate from the full course in architecture at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Boston, the first MIT woman graduate in architecture to have a lifetime career in her field, the first woman in the world to achieve state registration as an architect and a delineator of genius. Interviewed in 1913, Griffin was reported as saying with a suspicious twinkle in his eye that he's always contended that the ideas of his plan for the building of the new city of Canberra are much more than half due to his wife, and that she ought to have much more than half the credit for winning the competition. The Griffin Plan was an inspired synthesis of city planning ideals and ideas of the progressive era. The submission, usefully explained in this diagram by our colleague, the late Professor Paul Reed, consisted of an inner city plan prepared on the base map issued to all competitors, a spectacular city and environs plan, and even an even more spectacular perspective from the summit of Mount Ainsley, three sectional elevations and a report. A superb achievement, still held in the National Archives of Australia and inscribed on the UNESCO Memory of the World Register. Produced in a great flow of creativity in nine weeks at the end of 1911, the Canberra Plan is the Griffin's masterwork, a new capital for a new nation on the far side of the world, imagined in Chicago. The presentation drawings were produced at 1200 Steinway Hall, Van Buren Street, the 12th floor attic drafting space shared by a number of the progressive architects of the city under the roof of an 1890s office block designed by Marion's first cousin and Walter's first employer, Dwight Hill Perkins. The scheme is remarkable for the ideas which informed it, the resolution of those ideas and their artistic expression. Work on the Canberra Plan began within months of the Griffins' marriage and it is the first great achievement of their personal and professional partnership, a perfect expression of their complementary talents and personalities. This was described many years later by Eric Nichols, their Australian partner. Quote, Walter has been characterised as the thought and Marion as the will. As soon as Walter produced one of his many remarkable ideas, then Marion set about implementing it, and Griffin, with his tenacious nature, would not depart from it." Unquote. Although we cannot trace the actual evolution of the design, none of the preliminary studies are known to have survived. It is clear that the principal planning ideas behind the Canberra scheme can be attributed to Walter. 
and the superb set of presentation drawings to marry. The extensive architectural proposals for the city are almost certainly a collaborative achievement. Indeed, the brilliance of the scheme derives from the sense that ideas and their representation came together in a controlled outpouring of creative energy. This is nowhere more apparent than in the great rendering of the city plan and the endlessly inventive building designs schematically indicated in Marion's sectional elevations and perspective from Matt Ainsley. The light of inspiration shines through these drawings, glowing, confident, unique. From their Chicago office, the Griffins envisions a city not like any other city in the world, not just a unique city for a new nation, but a democratic city for a democratic nation. Walter and Marion Griffin were political idealists, American progressives imbued with a Jeffersonian commitment to freedom and democracy. To indicate how this American spirit can find physical form in the city, we need only consider New York's Central Park, designed in the mid-19th century by Frederick Law Olmsted and Calvert Volks. The first Central Park seems to be little more than the recreation of an English romantic landscape in the middle of Manhattan. Yet no matter where one enters from the crush and tumult of the city, the various winding paths lead through an evocation of nature to the mall, a plaisance, a long formal promenade under a canopy of elms. There on the mall, the citizens of the city are together again, but everyone is different for the experience of nature they have had. In this great public space, a democratic society recreates itself, reaffirms its values, experiences the reality of the abstract principles it proclaims. This is what the Griffins hoped to achieve in the plan for Canberra, to embody in the everyday life of the city the reality of the democratic experience. An idealism shines through their plan that is not just there in the second prize scheme by Eliel Saarinen, brilliant though it is, Saarinen, of course, from Helsinki, and the third prize scheme by Alfred Agache from Paris, and is conspicuously missing in the scheme selected by John Montgomery Cohn, submitted by the Australian team of Charles Caswell, Robert Coulter, and W. Scott Griffiths, that had uh, a completely worked out sewerage scheme. <laughs> the uh, underlying structure of the Griffin Plan, cross axes aligned on the principal hills, the land axis extended from an Ainsley to Capitol Hill and beyond, the water axis at right angles, uh, extended at right angles from Black Mountain through the center of the valley, seem self-evident. Yet no other surviving scheme from the competition made such a clear, compelling proposal on those alignments. The site presented a serious challenge with the buildable area restricted by the wide floodplain of the Malonglo. The Griffin solution was to dam the Malonglo, flood the floodplain, and create a series of lakes, make the inland site a special place in the Australian landscape. Again, this seems self-evident, yet few entrants in the Australian Federal Capital Competition made such an inspired and practical move. The brief call for a railway line built to mainline standards extending from the northwest to the southeast to connect the federal capital site with the Sydney-Melbourne line at Yass Junction. The base map issued to competitors indicated a possible alignment which cut through the middle of the site. Griffin moved the line to the north, took it through the city well back from the lake shore, introduced a series of suburban stations, entrenched the line in a cutting to maintain the integrity of the street network as it passed over, and tunneled a section through an outlying spur of Mount Ainsley to underground the central station and create a dramatic entry point to the city. The railway alignment was a winning move as far as James Alexander Smith was concerned, a member of the assessment board with experience of threading a rail line through a major city. James Alexander Smith appears to have been the strongest advocate for the Griffin Plan 
during the board's deliberations. He was certainly the only member of the board to remain a staunch supporter of Griffin in the coming years. <clears throat> the railway route from Yass Junction to the New South Wales township of Queenbeyan and to the southeast over gently undulating country posed no significant engineering challenges except for the crossing of the floodplain of the Malongla, where a major structure would be necessary. Here Griffin proposed not a bridge, but another dam designed to carry both the rail line and the major north-south road through the city, an earthen causeway which would impound a higher lake to the east of the central basins. The fill to build this work of infrastructure would be one from construction of the rail cuttings of the realigned rail route through the northern suburbs and the tunnel through the outlying spur of Mount Ainsley. <coughs> the higher lake, designed to fluctuate with the Australian pattern of droughts and flooding rains, would perform an ecological function with wetlands, reed beds and natural edges to clean the waters of the Malongo before they entered the central basins. This water system was integrated with decentralised wastewater recycling plants located in the catchment of every urban stream so that precious water from the potable supply in the western ranges would be reused in the establishment of a climate ameliorating urban forest on the treeless limestone plains. At a technical level, the Griffin Plan was a sophisticated, integrated proposal, endlessly fascinating in its deployment of the most advanced ideas of city building. For example, the streetcar network designed to augment the suburban rail system, reconstructed from long-lost plans by officers of the National Capital Authority in 2004 was so simple, logical and comprehensive that virtually the entire urban area of Griffin's extended city was within five minutes walk of public transport. As a devoted follower of the radical political economist Henry George, Walter Murray Griffin was inspired by the Australian government's land policy for the federal capital. The 1901 decision, supported by all political parties, to purchase all the land in the Federal Territory at rural prices of the day and hold it in public ownership in perpetuity. Griffin drew particular inspiration from this decision. Public ownership, leasehold tenure and land rent would make possible comprehensive community planning and in accordance with the principles of Henry George ensure that land earnings increased from rural to urban proportions purely through the advent of the capital population will accrue not to private individuals but to the community as a whole. As Griffin explained in a letter to King O'Malley after he won the competition, quote, I entered this Australian event to be my first and last competition solely because I have for many years greatly admired the bold, radical steps in politics and economics which your country has dared to take and which must, for a long time, set ideals for Europe and America ahead of their possibility of accomplishment. Yours is the greatest opportunity the world has afforded for the expression of the great civic ideal. Your advantages are not only in the characteristic Australian idealism and interest in government activity, but in the fundamental land policy of the capital, freed from land speculative selfish interest, the natural instincts of the community will guarantee higher aesthetic and social standards." Unquote. These were Griffin's ideals and values. For a nation he believed to be in the, quote, vanguard of political progress, he designed a capital city which was intended to express in its physical form the true nature of the democratic experience. Everyday activities and the functions of government were so arrayed in the landscape that by simply moving about the city, engaging in everyday life, the powers and responsibilities of government institutions, together with the rights and responsibilities of each individual, would become manifest. The city would be charged with self-evident truth its public landscape would have meaning for every citizen. Griffin's 
competition entry was a compelling proposal, a set of principles presented in a way to force the emphasis on the underlying ideas. Given the basic structure, a society which Griffin imagined shared his values and particular vision of the democratic experience would be quite able to develop the city in detail. As conceived in Chicago, the Griffin entry in the Australian federal capital competition was a classical utopia, an icon in which Griffin clearly believed Australia would see its own tendencies perfected. Walter Willie Griffin had remarkable activity, abilities as a landscape architect. From the material available to him in Chicago, he was able to grasp the significance of Canberra's regional setting, to completely visualize the site, to seize the strategic points, develop great vistas, adjust to subtle changes in relief, work with water, land, sky, and introduce as a constant theme the life force of nature. However, the controlling idea of the Griffin Plan was its social and political symbolism. This was expressed most forcefully in the design of the central area of the city. Across the broad valley of the Molonglo, Griffin inscribed a great triangle aligned on the mountains which rose above the site. The triangle was defined by tree-lined avenues and spanned the central basin of the impounded lake. For the base of the triangle, Griffin envisaged a continuous zone of activity, a commercial terrace which would be the premier address of the nation, backed by the premier shopping street and a residential district of courtyard apartments. The commercial terrace would overlook the central park of the city, which would reach down to the northern shore of the lake. Various public institutions and cultural facilities would be sited within this park. The National Stadium, the Opera House, auditoria for music and drama, museums of art, science and technology. In the same way, the Art Institute and Field Museum were sited in the public open spaces of Chicago's Lake Shore. With its walks and drives along the water's edge, its cultural institutions, its national sporting venue, its vital links with the everyday life of the city's business district, the central park of Griffin's Canberra was conceived as the people's park, the principal place of spontaneous congregation in the capital. The park and the street, freedom and enterprise would form the base of the triangle. In Griffin's schema, the base of the triangle would be the people. Looking across the lake to the government center, the completion of the triangle, the convergence of the avenues, would express in compelling physical form the will of the people. On the far lake shore between the people and their government, Griffin cited the federal judiciary. Behind this front rank of judicial buildings, the various government departments were symmetrically grouped in a contained bureaucratic entity around a formal court, a court of honor. Raised above the bureaucracy on a natural podium was the legislature, the houses of parliament, cited on axis with both chambers clearly expressed a visible presence in the city. In the Griffin Plan, the Houses of Parliament, though prominent, would not crown the ensemble of government buildings, as a higher hill stood on axis beyond. Capitol Hill was the climax of the entire scheme. There, the convergence of the avenues was resolved in a rotary sweeping around the crest of the hill, marking out the site of three significant buildings. Two of these, though small in scale, gained presence by their function and setting. The first was the official residence of the Governor General. The second, the official residence of the Prime Minister. Both were cited at the apex of the triangle to emphasize the central place and importance of the executive. With the two official residences given equal prominence, Griffin also managed to express the curious disposition of executive authority under the Australian Constitution. The view over the Houses of Parliament to the Central Park and Business District of the Capital affirmed that the executive required the support of a parliamentary majority. 
and ultimately the support of a majority of the people. The central triangle of Griffin's Canberra thus arranged the functions of the government in relation to the life of the city to express the very nature and workings of representative democracy. At one level, this exercise in civic design was a timeless, universal statement on the meaning of the democratic experience. But it was fixed in the Australian context by two devices, the alignment of the Great Triangle on the Australian landscape, the bushland preserves of Mount Ainsley and Black Mountain, and the focusing of the avenues on a building uniquely expressive of Australia. This was the building Griffin desi designated the Capitol, the third structure planned for Capitol Hill, sited in the most prominent position at the apex of the triangle between the two official residences. Griffin envisaged this building to be a place of popular assembly, a repository of national archives, and a pantheon commemorating national achievements. Shown in Marion Marnie's drawings as a stepped pyramid with a vast vaulted interior, the capital was conceived as a temple dedicated to the national spirit, an expression of the collective genius of the Australian people, the creation of the imagination and will of the entire community. The capital would stand at the focal point of the city plan and become the focus of national consciousness, a physical embodiment of all that was unique and distinctive in the Australian experience. In responding to the larger landscape of the Canberra Valley, Griffin saw the city as a theater with the government on stage. Quote, Taken altogether, the site may be considered as an irregular amphitheater with Ainsley at the northeast in the rear, flanked on either side by Black Mountain and Pleasant Hill, all forming the top galleries, with the slopes to the water, the auditorium, with the waterway and flood basin, the arena, with the southern slopes, the terraced stage and setting of monumental government structures, sharply defined, rising tier on tier to the culminating hill of the capital, and with Mugga Mugga, Red Hill, and the blue distant ranges, sun reflecting, forming the back scene of the theatrical whole. However, the city was conceived as a living entity, not a set piece. Movement through the landscape would engage everyone in the actual workings of democracy, with public and private institutions set in specific relationship to each other, their bounded domains of powers and responsibilities, their interrelationships and dependencies would be always apparent. The sense of meaningful space, sometimes subliminal, sometimes self-evident, would not be restricted to the monumental center of the capital. Throughout the city, Griffin's subtle adjustment of geometry to terrain, land use to circulation, parkland to built form, would create endless opportunities for abstract ideas to be fused with concrete experience. The National University, for example, was to have the most theoretical disciplines cited at the center of the campus, and the most applied, the professional schools, cited on an outer ring where the university met the city. One of the most intense sequences of spatial and symbolic experience was set out along Prospect Parkway, the urban element which extended along the land axis on the northern side of the lake. In the Griffins Canberra, this was both drawn and planned as a cross-section of city life. Prospect Parkway would extend from the National Stadium on the lakeshore to the forested slopes of Mount Ainsley. Griffin described the parkway as a formal pleasance, and Marion Marnie's perspective from the summit of Mount Ainsley clearly shows a sweep of space lined on both sides by <coughs> informal drifts of trees which merged into formal avenue plantings. This urban element was conceived as a grand promenade in the, tradition, in the tradition of the mall in Central Park, except it would be a meeting place in the heart of the city rather than a meeting place in a park. Served by a station on the city rail line and the streetcar network, which Griffin imagined would set the horizontal scale of this city, the parkway would be filled with crowds of people spilling onto its concourse to go about their daily business, to attend sporting events in the National Stadium, to visit the opera, theater, or museums, to go shopping. Residents 
from the nearby courtyard apartments would use this slice of green in the midst of high-density housing as their urban park, a human-scale, modulated space under a canopy of trees opening to an exhilarating prospects along the sweep of its essential greensward. The competition had called for an initial city population of 25,000. Griffin, interviewed by the New York Times on his success, mentioned a figure of 75,000 for his city. But this presumably included a low-density agricultural suburb located on the rich soils of ancient river terraces at Fishwick, and a low-density suburb for Chautauqua-like campsites for national associations at Yarralumna. If the full extent of Griffin City and environs had been developed to the density of, let's say, the first garden city, Letchworth, in England, it would have had a population of 120,000 people. If developed to the density Ebenezer Howard proposed in his 1898 tract on the Garden City, he would have had a population of 300,000. Almost the entire population of today's Canberra concentrated in the inner suburbs of North and South Canberra to Garden City standards. We built, of course, a city to Garden Suburb standards. With numbers like these, it can be seen that the Griffin Plaisance was intended to be a natural funnel of activity, a meeting place for people from the neighborhood, the city, the nation, a truly vital place in the life of the capital. <coughs> to be caught up in its energy, to walk along the, the central axis of the city, would be to experience an extraordinary transition from the public <coughs> to the private. To stand on the northern shore of the lake would be to experience the full impact of Griffin's symbolic schema, the brilliant sunlit ensemble of public institutions in all its power. This great prospect would also be visible from the stands of the National Stadium, where the contained spectacle of the sporting contest and the roar of the crowd projected across the lake would set the dynamics, the immediacy, the flux of contemporary life against the gravitas of national government. To turn 180 degrees, to turn from this set piece and be, be drawn along the axial line of the plaisance would be to experience a series of transitions from the civic, formal and spectacular to the private, informal and relaxed. From the capital's great cultural institutions, the theatre, the opera, the galleries, a promenade along the park parkway would, would cross at right angles the main commercial and retail streets of the city, cross the city railway line above the station, then proceed through the apartment belt to reach the forest preserve on the slopes of Mount Ainsley. To encourage people to use the full length of the mall, Griffin cited a casino at its upper end, a facility for popular entertainment and relaxation, somewhat like McKim Mead and White's <coughs> casino in Newport, Rhode Island, or the Midway Gardens, which Frank Lloyd Wright subsequently designed for a similar site on the Midway Plaisance in Chicago. Beyond the casino, the formal walks of a commemorative park would lead to bushland paths on the mountain slopes. As one climbed the mountain, the intimate scale and subtle qualities of the natural forest would contrast with the dramatic sense of the city provided at every outlook. <coughs> Stretched out in the valley below would be a compelling geometric form, aligned on the mountain itself, containing the center of national government. To climb the mountain and look out upon this scene of order, balance, and control would be to experience the tension between nature and the city, between the spiritual and the intellectual, between the unique perceptive qualities of each individual and the controls and mechanisms of society. In this way, nature would be embedded in the lived reality of the city for inspiration and individual empowerment. The architectural proposals for the city were, in effect, no more than suggestive but their brilliance still astonishes. The competition drawings of 1911 contain literally hundreds of architectural proposals. As an ensemble, the immediate source for this profusion of ideas was, of course, the architecture of the World's Fairs, the pavilions and exhibition halls at Chicago, 1893, St. Louis, 1904, and countless other expositions of that era, which incorporated architectural elements from all over the world, classical, Romanesque, Gothic, Mayan, Eastern, and more. All these are detectable in the Griffin's vision for Canberra. They just happen to be synthesized in a new way. Fascinating as it is to speculate on specific sources, 
The mystery key to the Griffin aesthetic resides in architectural principles. The first is geometry, the basis of all the Griffin's work with modular grids and pure form. The second is expression, the quality that comes from the fusion of program form and sight so that a building communicates its inner meaning. The third is structure and materials. Here the Griffin saw the potential of the age, particularly in the use of reinforced concrete. Linking these principles is movement through space and time, the direct experience of ephemeral qualities that has the potential to heighten our awareness and understanding. All this can be found in the work of Louis Sullivan, Frank Lloyd Wright, and other members of the Sullivan School in the Chicago of that era. But the Griffin's unparalleled achievement was to undertake a design exploration of this intensity at the scale of the modern city. The evolution of their design ideas in domestic and small-scale work can be seen in the progression from Wrightian motifs to more abstract, radical exercises in human-scale monumentality, flat roofs, pure form, ultimately fused with crystalline, lantern-like compositions of great imaginative power. In the Canberra drawings, these imaginative elements were extrapolated to the scale of an entire city. In a few weeks of intense activity, Walter and Marianne Griffin developed a complete design vocabulary flowing from the freedom of imagining a new city in Australia. Although a product of the Chicago milieu, the Griffin's proposals were as much a critique of their city as an expression of its progressive values. Chicago, of course, was the home of the skyscraper, but Griffin specifically rejected this building type. In his original report and all his subsequent writings on Canberra, Griffin rejected buildings of the height and scale of the Chicago skyscrapers, stating and restating the principle that the buildings of Canberra were to be horizontal, not vertical. Quote, with a liberality in public space and judicious distribution of centers and directness and speed and communication between all points, the necessity of making these large units stand on end as in the congested American cities, can be avoided in a capital city at least, securing a horizontal distribution of the large masses for more and better air, sunlight, verdure, and beauty." Unquote. To Griffin, the principle of horizontal building masses was integral to the spatial qualities, land use pattern, transportation and communication network, open space system, landscape, amenity, health, beauty, and national significance of the city. This principle was first promulgated from the top floor of a 12-story commercial block in the Chicago Loop. But the Griffin Plan can be considered a powerful other to the built reality of the Griffin City, most notably in, the can in relation to the Canberra Railway proposal, set back from the lake shore unlike the tracks of the Illinois Central Railroad that cut off the Chicago Loop from the shores of Lake Michigan. Griffin had undoubtedly absorbed the lessons of the American City Beautiful movement, ranging from the formal power of the Court of Honor at the White City, the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition, built under the direction of Daniel H. Burnham, which Griffin had experienced during his high school years. The integrated transportation systems that served the White City, the extension of City Beautiful principles beyond World's Fair settings to the redesign of Washington, D.C. in the early years of the 20th century, again under the direction of Burnham. The reconsideration of L'Enfance's 1791 plan for Washington as part of this exercise, which highlighted its grounding in the division of legislative and executive power under the American Constitution. The comprehensive park system proposed for Washington, D.C. by Frederick Law Olmsted, Jr., reinterpreting the great park schemes of his father. The Burnham Plan for San Francisco of 1904 and 1905, which proposed extensions of the Market Street focus on Twin Peaks uh, with uh, new parkways and park systems extending west to the Pacific Ocean from the heights of Mount Parnassus. The Burnham Plan of Chicago of 1909, which proposed a new civic center at the center of a new system of radial avenues, new cultural facilities, such as an opera house on Michigan Avenue, 
uh, built as an extension of Grant Park over the tracks of the Illinois Central Railroad uh, extending to the lakefront. The park system proposed in the Chicago Plan, which envisaged a dramatic extension of community proposals for the Cook County Forest Preserve System to a new network of regional open space. The Griffin Plan also synthesized uh, elements of Howard's Garden City, not just in the formal correspondence of its concentric radial structure with Howard's generic diagrams, but in the balanced provision of an agricultural suburb, a manufacturing suburb, and extensive networks of parks and gardens and a surrounding green belt. The Griffin Plan also shared with Howard's Garden City an underpinning commitment to the political economy of Henry George with land value taxation aimed at funding urban development by the capture of the unearned increment. The utter brilliance, uh, uh, Henry George, the utter brilliance of the Canberra Plan turned out to be too much for the government officials who'd organized the Australian Federal Capital Constitution. Uh, <clears throat> they were looking for ideas for a city plan, not an ideal city plan. The officials advised Minister O'Malley that the Griffin Plan, indeed all the premiered schemes in the competition, were too expensive and persuaded him oh, there was no cost uh, restriction in the competition brief, but they were too expensive and persuaded O'Malley to adopt a plan they devised themselves, the notorious departmental board plan of December 1912. This was a complete hodgepodge of borrowed elements which raised a storm of protest worldwide. A change of government in 1913 resulted in the invitation for Griffin to visit Australia. His subsequent appointment as Federal Capital Director of Design and Construction, disbandment of the departmental board. However, Griffin still had to deal with these officials in their official capacities as permanent head of the Department of Home Affairs, Director General of Works, Commonwealth <laughs> Surveyor General, Commonwealth Architect, etc. Over the next seven years, they made his job almost impossible and succeeded in driving Griffin off the project at the end of 1920. The Griffins cultivated their own garden. Here, at their experimental one-room house in the Griffin Design Glenard Estate on the banks of the Arrow River in Heidelberg, Victoria. And in a private practice, which had already seen Newman College at the University of Melbourne brought to completion an indicator of what they could have achieved if given a large commission at Canberra. By the early 1920s, the garden suburb of Castle Crag was underway on the shores of Sydney Harbour, so much in tune with Marion Griffin's celebration of the Australian bush in her brilliant series of forest portraits. In Melbourne, the Griffins went on to design the Capitol Theatre in Swanston Street, across from the Melbourne Town Hall, a spatial fantasy described by Robin Boyd as the best cinema that was ever built or is ever likely to be built, <laughs> evoking in its way the unbuilt capital of the Canberra plan. A similar language of prismatic elements and star-shaped lights creating spectacular colour effects was also deployed in the Griffin transformation of the Palais de Danse and the Esplanade on the Bay Shore at St Kilda. In the early 1950s, these installations on the edge of Melbourne suburbia, inspired a series of works by the Melbourne artist Charles Blackman. Spiky, edgy, experimental, <coughs> night and day responses to the extraordinary in the midst of the everyday. Uh, I should mention that with Blackman, St Kilda life took on another dimension, but Beneath the Griffin light can be considered emblematic of a coming of age of the creative spirit in Australia. A spirit at times thwarted, but also at times exalted in extraordinary works, such as the memorial to Griffin by Bim Hilda, 
commissioned by the community at Castle Crag and installed at the entry to the garden suburb in 1965. A work of space, light, water, prismatic form, in beaten copper, grey-green against the bush, an inspired re-reading of everything Griffin brought to Australia. Today in Canberra, aspects of the city bear some relationship to the Griffin plan. The axial alignment, the idea of the lake, if not its form and ecological function, the street network of the inner suburbs, the pyramidal outline of the Griffin capital crowning Jurgler's parliament. Over the past 100 years, some positive moves have resulted in the survival of these elements. First, Griffin was invited to Australia in 1913 by the Cook government and appointed Federal Capital Director of Design and Construction. Over the next seven years, as we mentioned, he had an extraordinarily difficult time at the hands of Australian bureaucrats and politicians, not helped by the disaster of World War I. But he managed some significant achievements, such as the 1917 map that established the main axial lines of the city provided the basis for the grading of the principal avenues. After he was forced from the project in 1920, a 1925 decision by the Bruce government to make his street pattern law to be changed only with the approval of Parliament enshrined the physical outline of his ideas. Sadly, not his land use and symbolic intent. Thirty years later, a campaign to recognise the Griffin Plan as a major work of landscape architecture, led by Peter Harrison, senior lecturer in town planning at the University of Sydney and one of the first great Griffin scholars, who subsequently appointed the first chief planner of the National Capital Development Commission, resulted in the long-delayed creation of the lake and the high-level bridges on Kings, and, on Kings and Commonwealth Avenues, making the outline of Griffin's parliamentary triangle visible and tangible in the Canberra landscape. In the period 1976 to 1980, Peter Muller and Paul Reed, senior architects of the National Capital Development Commission, took sympathetic interest in the ideas of the Griffin Plan and produced numerous studies of the parliamentary triangle based on the physical form, but not the symbolic intent of the Griffin proposals. This led in turn to the competition for Parliament House on Capitol Hill and the winning scheme by Romaldo Jurgler of Mitchell, Jurgler and Thorpe, which referenced Griffin massing in form in somewhat spiritless outline. After ACT self-government in the 1980s, the National Capital Authority undertook a number of studies of the central national area, culminating in the Griffin Legacy Project of 2002 to 2004, which unearthed much valuable documentation of Griffin's detailed development proposals and set in place controversial schemes for the redevelopment of the symbolic centre of Canberra in Griffin's name. However, it, it must be said, after all these years, the results are underwhelming. Uh, Canberra today has elements of the Griffin Plan, but not the full intensity and resonance of the original vision. And as the centenary of the city approaches, our national capital is facing a planning challenge of crisis proportions. Since self-government was granted to the Australian Capital Territory in the late 1980s, Canberra's planning has been divided between the national government and the city government between the National Capital Authority established by the National Government and the planning entities established by the City Government, dispersed these days among the Environment and Sustainable Development Directorate, the Land Development Agency and the Chief Minister's Office. The National Capital Authority has had a troubled existence. There have been four major inquiries into its role and function since 2004. The most recent, an inquiry by the eminent retired civil servant, Dr. Alan Hawke, was completed in July last year. Minister Crean, who occupies the King O'Malley position in the Gillard government today, uh, tabled the government's response on the 8th of May, the other week, 10 months later. It is a craven abdication 
of responsibility. Minister Crean announced that the national government is limiting its responsibility to reduced areas of national importance, handing over complete planning responsibility for the rest of the ACT to the ACT government. The planning system in place since the 1980s, whereby the territory government is the territory plan is subservient to the national capital plan, is to be reversed. The national capital plan will now be subservient to the territory plan. The National Capital Authority has been instructed to abandon all strategic planning roles and responsibilities. The National Capital and its metro region will no longer be planned in the national interest. To carry out the administrative arrangements associated with reduction in its role, the NCA has been given an allocation of $11.9 million in the recent budget to be spent over four years. To place this pitiful appropriation in context. The Australian War Memorial was given $27 million by the Gillard government to refurbish the World War I galleries in time for the Gallipoli centenary. The $11.9 million appears to be a response to a cry for help by the former chairman of the National Capital Authority, Professor Don Aitken, in an appearance before the Parliamentary Standing Committee on the National Capital in June 2011, when he stated, since the budget decisions of 2007-2008, we have been manifestly short of the necessary funds to do what we are ordained by law to do. We need a clear statement from the Commonwealth Government that the NCA has a role, both in the maintenance of the public estate and in the future planning of the national capital. The national government is not interested in the national over at the ACT government, the approaching centenary of Canberra is being marked by an international design competition launched in association with the Australian Institute of Architects calling for big ideas for a hypothetical Australian capital city promoted under the awkward name Capathetical. The competition invites responses to many questions including, would you build a new capital today? Or could the Australian Federation be expressed in a different way? So, we have the national government not interested in the national capital. And the ACT government proclaiming to the world that if they had to do it all over again, they would rather not be there. We have, in effect, a legitimation crisis where the fundamental legitimacy of Canberra is in question. How did we reach this situation? The explanation is complex, but one important source of the conundrum resides in the relationship of the two principal plans generated in the history of Canberra to date. The Griffin Plan of 1911, contained, relatively dense, and planned for a transport system based on a suburban railway and a streetcar system, neither of which happened, and the National Capital Development Commission Plan of 1971, known as the Y Plan, a dispersed, low-density, linear city based on the motor car. As the eminent planning historian Dr. Carl Fisher has pointed out, the physical planning of Canberra demonstrates a catalogue of 20th century ideal types, which has intrinsic fascination and value. But Unfortunately, the two principal plans have cancelled each other out. The Griffin Plan remains largely empty in the centre and the Y Plan is too dispersed. The national government is not interested in filling in the empty centre of the Griffin Plan and the ACT government cannot afford to maintain the low density dispersed city of the Y Plan without selling more land on the periphery and compounding its problems. Pushing yield over amenity, this government has been responsible for some of the worst suburban development in Australia in recent decades. The retreat from high standards of planning and design in the 80s and 90s
coincided with the neoliberal turn in national politics and socio-economic policy, whereby Canberra came to represent not the best, but the very worst in planning, as perversely another ideal type, the local developers. Carl Fisher has drawn attention to this phenomenon and has also drawn attention to something of an urban renaissance in Canberra planning that occurred in the years 2001 to 2004, centred on notions of new urbanism, sustainability, creative cities and so on. This new agenda was encapsulated in the 2002 OECD, OECD report, Urban Renaissance, Canberra, a Sustainable Future. Initial pub also, initial public consultation by the ACD government on an integrated social, environmental and physical plan for the city. And a new urbanist venture for Inner Canberra undertaken by the NCA, NCA the so-called Griffin Legacy Project, inspired by the Washington DC framework legacy of the 1990s. The Griffin Legacy Project proposed developing the extensive holdings of national land in the symbolic centre of Canberra as a new urbanist precinct, replacing isolated buildings and landscape with continuous urban fabric. However, in reality, the urban renaissance has unraveled. As far as purposeful planning and urban development are concerned, a brief Canberra spring has ended. Again, for complex reasons, not the least being a long, hot summer in 2002-2003, at the height of which a series of bushfires, sparked by lightning strikes in the western ranges, poorly managed for years, by the ACT government, converged on the city in a tremendous conflagra conflagration of firestorm dimensions. The long, exposed western flank of the White Plain was engulfed. The result, four deaths, only four, four, four deaths, more than 500 homes destroyed. The historic Mount Stromlo Observatory destroyed, along with most of the territory's timber production forests. In total, 70% of the ACT was burnt that day. Although never confronted by the responsible authorities, this disaster has its origins in the division of planning and land management responsibilities in the 1980s, whereby a national government became responsible for a city park, and a city government became responsible for a national park. In the aftermath, ACT government planning has become totally irrational, selecting the burnt out lands as the site for new suburbs for 50,000 residents, further extending and exposing the western flank of the city in the era of climate change to fires driven from the national parks and wilderness areas by hot westerly winds from the deserts of central Australia. The new suburban development located along the lower reaches of the Wollongla River is supported by extensive ecological studies and represents a new style of post-urban renaissance planning that once again we call hybrid urbanism. In the sense of the hybrid car, a combination of eco-components and the dark reality of business as usual. The confusion generated by hybrid urbanism finds clear expression in the final document produced by the ACT government from its 2002-2004 spatial planning exercise, which aims at concentrating arterial traffic flows through the symbolic centre of the city. At the NCA, the first project under the Griffin legacy, a new headquarters for Australia's central spy agency, um, <laughs> broke the fundamental new urbanist principle of the authority's own plan by approving yet another isolated building and landscape, a structure standalone and high security, not a contribution to continuous urban fabric embedded in the streets and blocks of an inner city neighbourhood to realise the vision of a sort of Boulevard Saint-Germain on Constitution Avenue. 
Without the means of implementing the urban infrastructure for the Griffin Legacy proposal, the project remains in limbo, except for the activities of Canberra's private developers who have cherry-picked the available up-zoned lots to proceed with spot developments of their own, as in the case of the new Acton Nishi development, which includes a green building featuring green roofs and green walls on a development parcel with 100% site coverage. This is an as-of-right development under the so-called Griffin Legacy Amendments to the National Capital Plan approved by the Howard government in 2007. A display of hybrid urbanism writ large at 22 stories effectively the same height as the Chicago skyscrapers of Griffin's day which he argued against in every statement he ever made on Canberra. The overall Griffin legacy proposal, 1,845,000 square metres of development, three times the size of Sydney's Barangaroo, is simply beyond the planning and project delivery capabilities of the NCA, but not beyond the imagination of local developers. <laughs> the, uh, the, the NCA, reduced in staff, short of expertise, and fighting for survival, has been set on a path of reduced responsibility, no longer concerned with the overall setting of the national capital, struggling to manage at best fragments of the central national area. Between the mediocrity of the ACT government and the impotence of the NCA, the fate of one of the greatest planned capitals of the 20th century hangs in the balance. If there is a way forward, the answer may lie in more ecological management of the metro region, more density, more public transport, more public consultation, a more sustainable funding pace, and more design excellence for Canberra. The very ideas embedded in the Griffin Plan of 1912. But fundamentally, none of this will have much substance <coughs> without an integrated planning system and more vision, more accurately, a return to the big idea of the Griffin Plan, a return to the Griffin vision of Canberra as the expression of Australian parliamentary democracy, a vision that was put before us 100 years ago today by Walter Burley Griffin and Marion Marnie Griffin. Thank you very much. Thank you.